So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, we're live now. So uh, we've been having a quite a quite an interesting discussion already about uh, language development for for teachers and especially for for non-native speakers and what it means. So um, I'm really I'm really curious to see uh, what you're going to talk about. And I've heard a lot about this talk. So um, I'm really pleased that uh, finally uh, finally we've got you here because. Uh, Last time in June, it didn't it didn't quite work out. So uh, so it's great yeah. that uh, that uh, that you're back and uh, we're finally having this webinar here. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm all ears and uh, really looking forward to it. Thank you, Mary. Me too. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, TEFL Equity. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mary, for the invitation. Uh, I am going to say this now on record that I am a very very big fan. Of, uh, of the blog, of the idea. I do think there is a lot of, um, well, it's, it's not a matter of thinking, it's obvious, everybody knows that. There's a lot of prejudice out there against we non-native speakers of English. By the way, uh, just for the sake of um, not having to say non-native English speaking teachers from now on, when I am talking about non-natives, I'm going to refer to them, to us, as nests, and whenever I talk about native speakers, which is a very hard concept to define, but anyway, whenever I talk about native speakers, I'm going to just I'm just going to say natives. It might not be a very uh, or very correct or very precise um, jargon, but that's what I'm going to go with. So nests, uh, people like me, Brazilians, and uh, natives, people who were born uh, in the inner circle, people who speak English as a first language. All right. So again, thank you very much uh, for, for being here on a Sunday. It is now in Brazil just past midday, noon, so I know you're, you're all probably really hungry. Uh, and everywhere else in the world. What time is it in, in Poland right now? 5 p.m., right? Uh, so you're probably um, already looking forward to dinner. Yeah, all right. By 5 p.m. in Europe. Right, 5 p.m. in Europe. Okay. So uh, as you can see here on the, on the cover slide, we're going to be talking about our English, yeah? our English. And you see this picture here in the middle, the elephant in the room. I'm sure you're familiar with this expression, the elephant in the room. And it is my contention, it is my opinion that um, we in ELT know that there is a very serious issue with teachers, with NEST's knowledge of English, use of English in Brazil, but I'm sure that this is the case too in, in other countries where English is um, taught primarily by uh, by nests like in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Turkey, and so on. And it, so, so we know that there is, it's very clear, everybody knows that there is a serious language issue that some teachers have lots of difficulty to communicate. In Brazil, there are teachers who teach, for example, in public education and simply cannot speak English and, uh, or, or can do it only at a very, very, very basic level. And, and this ends up I think, um, having very complicated consequences for nests all over the country. And it is, I think, one of the reasons why uh, we are, well, students normally or, or several times or very often prefer natives to us. So I think we should start talking about language development for teachers much more often than we do, right? Uh, you might be familiar with this concept here, the concept of RSNIP. Do you know what this is as an acronym? So please participate here in the chat box, right? I really want to hear what you guys have to say. Are you familiar with RSNIP? So I see Danielle and Karina are typing here. Hello. Good afternoon, Karina. How are you? All right. So, uh, this is a, a, an acronym that is quite famous in the, in, in the business, especially if you write, if you write course books 
or if you write materials for students that are going to be used internationally. Uh, these are the topics that you should or you must avoid when you are writing materials for students. So you shouldn't talk about politics, religion, alcohol, sex, narcotics, isms. And the reason for that is that, of course, when you write a course book or when you write materials for students, you will want the, these materials to be used all over the world. You want them to be sellable you know, all the, 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 the world. And then you cannot have topics that are going to perhaps offend um, specific markets um, all over the world. And it seems to me that in the area of teacher development, uh, in the area of helping teachers improve professional development, you should add LDT to this parsnip because apparently there was a memo, which I missed at some point, that said that we were forbidden to talk about language development for teachers and the fact that some teachers in countries like Brazil, which is where I work, um, as I said before, cannot speak English or, have, or speak English with a lot of difficulty and therefore there are several students who, who tend to prefer uh, natives to us. I think, obviously, it is high time we stopped uh, not talking about this. We need to, 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 to put this issue on the table and perhaps come up with ways in which teachers can improve their knowledge of English, their use of English, and, uh, and, and as a consequence of that, have a better chance to, 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 to fight. Um, well, fight natives might be a strong way of putting that, but compete with natives in the, in the, in the ELT market more successfully. All right, so during this webinar, I'm going to be discussing these things. These are my claims. Teachers of English need to study a lot of English, and of course, not only nests, but also native teachers need to study a lot of English, and they don't. Yeah. And here I am talking specifically about uh, nests. When I say they don't, of course, they might be unfair. I'm sure many people do, many teachers do. I do, and perhaps many people here in this room do too. But you don't have to look very far to find teachers like the ones I referred to in the beginning, teachers who have serious difficulty, lots of difficulty to, to get their messages across in English. And I believe that um, if we, we, we discuss this more openly, perhaps people would study more English and get uh, better at it. So therefore, the overall language level of Brazilian teachers, and I, I stress the fact that I'm talking about Brazilian teachers specifically here, because this is my reality. I mean, I have never taught English anywhere else in the world. Um, I have been to several other ELT markets and I've participated in a lot of, of uh, ELT conferences, uh, IATAFL, for example, several times. And I see that this is also the reality for teachers in several other countries, but the ones that I really know and the, and the, and the teachers that I work with on a daily basis, they are resilient. And I think ELT ignores this to a certain extent. Authors ignore this. Schools ignore this. Teachers ignore this. And one of the many consequences of that is that native speakers thrive. Yeah? And students tend to prefer them. Uh, now, perhaps it is, no, not perhaps, it is unfair, of course, because um, I, for example, while I was studying English, and I've only, st I've only ever studied English in Brazil, all my teachers, actually, or, or at least the vast majority of my teachers, they were nests, and they were absolutely fantastic teachers who spoke great English and who invested time and money as well in their language development. And I owe a lot to these teachers. Yeah? So uh, it's very important to say here at the beginning that my point here, my, my objective here, is not to say in any way that uh, students show, or to agree that students should prefer natives, evidently. I mean, I am a nest myself. I'm, I'm simply saying that based on my experience, one of the reasons why um, students tend to prefer 
natives and schools tend to hire natives in Brazil, even natives who are completely unprepared to teach English just because um, we don't invest as much as we should time, money, but especially time in our language development. And then nobody talks about this. Uh, if you want to, for example, learn how to teach listening better, or if you want to read a little bit on how to teach writing or on how to become a better class manager, you're going to find lots and lots of articles and lots and lots of courses uh, uh, all over the world that you can do to, to, to work on that. But if you want to improve your language as a teacher, then certainly you're going to have a lot less available. Yeah. So Emily said here, I know lots of colleagues in that comfort zone. That's about Eric Velton said, I have friends who've been teaching for only five years and they say they don't need to study anymore. Yeah, so this is very serious. And um, I think perhaps if we talked about it, uh, we could find ways to, to, to improve that situation. But let's go on. Hopefully by the end of this, we'll have discussed this and problematized area uh, of teacher's language skills and why this area is unproblematized, the examples of this elephant in the room, uh, the very little that is done because there is something being done, what should be done by EOT, I think, and what can and should be done by us, yeah, by teachers. All right, so first I'm going to start with a quote. This is Scott Thornbury, our uh, Bruce Springsteen, the boss. Among the consequences of, uh, I know that you're not supposed to read the quotes that you put on your slides, but this one I will, so bear with me. Among the consequences of a limited knowledge of language are a failure on the part of the teacher to anticipate learners learning problems and a consequent inability to plan lessons that are pitched at the right level. An inability to deal satisfactorily with errors or to field learners' queries. And a general failure to earn the confidence of the learners due to a lack of basic terminology and ability to present new language clearly and efficiently. This is then Scott Thornbury in his incredible book about language. Uh, well, the book is about language and the book is also called About Language. By the way, I was just reading this. Yeah, unfortunately, this was only brought to my attention today. It is an article by Scott Thornbury in the, the latest issue of English Teaching Professional. And um, anyway, I'm going to be referring to this article throughout the webinar. But again, he is, he is addressing the issue of, of um, teacher's language. But the thing is, uh, first of all, I agree 100% with this, obviously, but uh, uh, Thornbury here, he was talking about teachers in general. He was not talking specifically about uh, nests, but um, I completely agree. I was discussing this with Merrick before we started recording that um, it is true for every teacher that we need to know a lot more about English and that we need to study English every single day of our careers and we have to get better and better at it. But I believe, and I think this is really, really obvious, that this is even more true or is true in a wider variety of ways for us nests. No. Then uh, this is Peter Roach in his book English Phonetics and Phonology. He says pretty much the same thing in different words. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a second to have a look at that one. Yeah. Then, just one more for now. This is a very long one by Jeremy Harner in uh, the third edition, or the, no, the fourth edition of the practice of English language teaching. So again, the teachers need to be aware of pronunciation features, stress and intonation. Uh, I, I, I very much like this part where he says, students have a right to expect the teachers of the English language can explain straightforward grammar concepts, including how and when they're used, they expect their teachers to know the difference between colloquial language that people use in informal conversation and the more formal language required in more formal settings. Discourse, yeah, a knowledge of discourse is also very important for teachers of English. Now, um, I have been researching this and working with language development for teachers for a very long time, nearly 10 years. And um, I think that this is all very true. I couldn't agree more with Harmer, with Roach, with Thornbury. And actually, I haven't been able to, in 10 years, find anyone who thought that language development for teachers was not important or that teachers did not need to know a lot 
about the language they taught, or that they did not know to, or they did not need to know how to speak English very well and communicate very effectively. But again, and I'm going to say this many times over the next 40 minutes or so, uh, everybody knows that, but nobody talks about that. And, and the fact that, for example, in Brazil, and I am sure that this is the case in, in, in other countries as well, in many other countries, we study English in public education, regular education, for eight years at the very least. And still, we live in a country where, according to the, the British Council, only about 5% of the population speak English. And it is not very clearly defined what they consider speaking English to be. I mean, if it is at C1 level or A2 level. So why is it that it happens? I mean, we have this very serious um, problem, and it is very clear to see. How can we study eight years of something in school and not be able to use it? I mean, how is that possible? It is not so hard to, to, to imagine how, how that is possible. The thing is that the, the, the requirements for you to be an English teacher in public education, in regular education, do not include fluency in English. You do not actually have to be able to speak English. And, and as a matter of fact, most teachers in that particular setting don't. Yeah? So um, how can we not be talking more about this is what is beyond me. It's what, it's what I can't understand. I mean, how how is it that we have so many books on learning more about how to teach writing or how to teach reading or how we get together in conferences such as the IATAFO and the TESOL where we have respectively nearly 2,000, nearly 5,000 teachers together and you're not going to find a single talk or you're going to find perhaps one or two on language development for teachers. Why is it that we look at our specialized literature, we, we look at our periodicals, we look at English Teaching Professional, Modern English Teacher, The Voices magazine, and even the Brastiso magazine up to very recently, and you are not going to find a single article that addresses language development for teachers. How is it that Thornbury, Harmer, Roach, and every single other writer in the area think knowledge about English is so important, and yet they travel to Brazil, Argentina, Turkey, Poland, and, and, uh, and, and, and they just don't talk about it. Yeah? So they, they, they're there, they have 100, 200, 500, 1,000 Brazilian teachers in the room, and they could perhaps use that opportunity to tell teachers, look, I know this is quite obvious, but what are you doing to improve your knowledge of English? I mean, uh, we're all very angry that students tend to prefer natives over us, that schools tend to pay natives better than they pay us and everything. But um, out of the many, many things that we can do to perhaps curb that or, 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 or improve that situation is knowing a lot about English, improving your English considerably. And what have you been doing to improve your English lately? So why is it that they're not talking about this? Uh, I, I did this very talk in Rio a couple of months ago, and uh, in the audience there was, I am not going to say the name of the author here because I didn't ask for permission, so I'm not, but there was a very important writer, a very important speaker, international speaker in the audience, and uh, I am going to refer to this person as a he, but I'm not saying necessarily that he was a man, that he was a he. But what he said to me was, <clears throat> well, it's very easy. The answer to your question is actually very easy. We don't talk about this because we have to submit our talks, our slides, to the publishers who are paying for our trip, who are sponsoring our trips, and they would never allow us to visit these countries and talk about that. So it is okay for me to observe your class and to tell you that you have to work on your classroom management. It is fine for me to say that you have to work on your uh, presentation of grammar. 
on your TTT or whatever, if we're, if we're still talking about that. But why is it that it's not okay for us to talk about language development? I can tell you that you have to improve your classroom management, but I cannot tell you that you have to improve your English. You know? Uh, this is very unfair. If you go back and look at the plenary speakers, for example, in all the big conferences all over the world, even here in Brazil in the Brass TISA, if you look at the plenary speakers that we have, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that 95 or sometimes 100% of them are natives. They're native speakers of English. Why is that? Is it because they're really so much better than us? Or is it because the sometimes fantastic teachers that we have in Brazil, in Poland, in Turkey, in Japan, in China, they simply don't have the language proficiency to, to present at a place like that? Uh, if you look, for example, at the last IATAFL conference, there was, uh, out of the five plenary speakers, there was one uh, nest, just one. It was Dr. Harry Kucha, or Kucha Kucha. Sorry, don't remember, but uh, Dr. Harry Kucha. But you know what? He was, a he, he was a nest, it's true, wonderful, from Cameroon, who does an absolutely fantastic job in his home country. Uh, but, you know, I don't know much about Dr. Kucha to be honest. But you know one thing I know? Because I saw him, he is an absolutely proficient speaker of English. Yeah? So it is true, there is prejudice, it is true, we are looked down on in ELT, we nests. But if we are going to do something about it, and if we are going to, in time, uh, I don't know, even the play field a little bit, it's going to be among several other things, of course, but it's going to be through language development as well. Yeah? Because when you sound like Merrick, when you speak English like Merrick, then you can fight. Then you, then, then you can actually fight um, internationally for our rights. You can represent us. Yeah? And when you don't, when you have difficulty to get the most basic ideas across in the language you teach, and it's going to be very, very, very hard to, uh, to actually do something about it, to actually change the situation. Uh, Stephanie mentioned lack of time, and Merrick says he doesn't think it's a very good excuse. Yeah, Stephanie, I'm sorry, I don't think it's a very good excuse either. Uh, we do have time for, um, for a lot of things. I am not going to, to go into that, but... Uh, for example, reading, I am going to, to talk about that at the end of the, of the webinar, how to actually improve. Uh, I'm going to talk about ideas that have worked for me and that I have seen work for many of my student teachers over the years, but I think reading is the most important of them. And uh, everybody has time to read. I mean, we commute um, 20 minutes before going to bed. I mean, it's not just about sitting down and studying grammar or, or, or reading about phonology. It is also about these things. But... Uh, perhaps watching series with curiosity, trying to imitate the way people speak in series in, 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 in news programs and uh, paying attention to the language you read and trying to get informed. Uh, for example, here in Brazil, it's very common for us to have as the home page in our computers, wall. Yeah. Perhaps change that to the New York Times, to, to the Guardian, to the Independent, whatever, and read a little bit about, uh, uh, read the news in it. So there are many things you can do that don't actually demand much time. Yeah. All right, let me move on, otherwise I'm not going to get even uh, close to finishing this. Uh, so this, uh, this was posted uh, on the blog of well, one of the most important ELT practitioners in the world, in my opinion, Luis Otávio Barros, Brazilian. If you don't know Luis, I mean, this is your chance, and you should start reading his blog today. Here's the address. And a couple of years ago, I think it was, uh, Luis posted this on his blog. Ten things that you might be saying wrong in the classroom. I open your books on page, time's over. Do you want me to explain you the rule again? Blah, blah, blah. And I think this is terrific. Uh, uh, this generated a lot of conversation, lots of interesting um, comments on the blog. And, well, beautiful thing. But honestly, guys, what I am talking about is not classroom language. I'm not talking about saying open your books to page 20 or, um, 
or, or, or the fact that you don't discuss about politics, you discuss politics. What I'm talking about is communicative competence. Yeah? This quote here is from a friend of mine who is a, a Celta tutor and was one of my Delta tutors here in Sao Paulo. Again, I'm not saying his name because I didn't ask for his permission, uh, but I completely agree with him. So basically, he says that uh, instructional discourse, speaking the language at the right level, teacher talking time, setting and checking instructions, blah, blah, blah. The very little that is done about language development is usually related to classroom language. Yeah. So, uh, so that is covered, I think. That is covered. We do talk about that. About, and, and this, again, is not only for us nests. This is for natives as well. Natives have that, dif that difficulty as well. And since the CELTA course was actually devised, the ISEL course was actually devised, at least originally, I think, for um, or in a, a, a native context. Uh, so this language is actually, this is actually discussed. But this is not, this is not what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, Look at the second paragraph. He says, the point I'm trying to make is that LTT, language development for teachers, also refers to teachers' communicative competence, the grammatical knowledge of syntax, morphology, phonology, and the like, social knowledge as well. And then he says, I insist that there's very little out there, and I couldn't agree more. There's between very little and absolutely nothing out there to address this particular problem. And it's a huge one. Yeah? It's like teaching geography and, and not knowing where Brazil is. This is uh, another very good friend of mine, first uh, Vice President of Brass Tiso, Henry Cobrea. And he says, as someone who's had his hand dabbling in the business of hiring and training teachers, the number one issue I faced in hiring a teacher was lack of command of the language. Yeah? And then he says, he goes on to say, it doesn't matter how knowledgeable you may be in issues such as methodology, techniques, and resources, if you haven't got the content knowledge in your area, you won't be able to teach at a certain level. It's true, it's true. Yeah. So, we do talk about this on Facebook, we do talk about, for example, I am president here in Brazil of the TGSIG of the Brass TISO, the Brazilian Association of TISO. And when we created that SIG, we were actually going to call it Language Development for Teachers SIG. Yeah. But, well, we didn't, because we didn't want to talk just about the one thing, but uh, we, we do take it very seriously, and, and, and it is uh, the one thing where all the four of us the, the, the founding members of the SIG. It is the one thing that we're most uh, interested in. Yeah. And, um, but, but, but it's not enough, right? It's just one SIG in one organization. We need Scott Thornbury to talk about that. We need Jeremy Harmer to talk about that. We need David Crystal to talk about that. We need, I don't like to use this term, but anyway, we need bigger people in the business talking about that so that people will take it seriously. I can get my teach your students to study more English. I can get the people who go to my talks to study more English, some of them anyway. But um, globally, there's not much I can do. I can try. I can, for example, give a webinar on, on TEFL equity, which is uh, certainly very popular and definitely international. But, um, but we have to get together. I mean, if we agree, that we teachers need to speak better English, that we need to know more about English, then we have to get together and do something about it. Yeah? I, I always like to quote, um, what's his name? Uh, ben Parker. Do you know who Ben Parker is? Answer here, please, in the chat box. Do you know who Ben Parker is? Do you? Do you? Do you? Do you? Ben Parker? Ben Parker? No? No? Ben Parker is Spider-Man's uncle. Yeah, Peter Parker's uncle, and he says, and I'm sure everybody's heard that before, yes, exactly, he says, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you're here today on a Sunday participating in this webinar, I believe that you might be one of the, one of the lucky ones, one of the proficient ones, one of the successful uh, 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 teachers in the business, one of the teacher trainers, one of the people who can actually form opinions. And I think that with this power, comes great responsibility. Yeah? If you are proficient, if you are a teacher trainer, if you have the means to address a certain number of teachers on a regular basis, then you are absolutely 
um, it, it is it is mandatory that you talk about it yeah? and that you help people see that uh, one of the most important things that they can do to be more successful, to have more students, to make more money, to make a bigger difference in their students' lives, is to improve their knowledge of English. Yeah? Okay, so I was saying, <clears throat> I was telling you what I was not talking about. Yeah, what what it is that I am talking about. Then. I am going to refer them for the first time to to Scott Thornbury's uh, article. Again, the magazine is English Teaching Professional. Sorry, I actually have the link here to share with you, so everybody can read this. Not now, please. Now you pay attention to me, interact with me. But this is uh, Scott Thornbury's article in the latest edition, in the 100th edition of English Teaching Professional. He says, it does seem self-evident, though, that language teachers should know a lot about their subject, language, just as we would expect doctors to know a lot about medicine and rocket scientists to know a lot about rocket science. And uh, there was another part that I wanted to read to you. I highlighted stuff here, but I can't find it. So, anyway. Uh, what I am talking about, then, is that teachers need to know a lot and study regularly grammar, vocabulary, phonology, and discourse. You will see in, in, in Thornbury's um, article that he talks a lot about grammar, and he explains why he talks a lot about grammar. But, um, but he mentions here, I'm going to try to show it to you, I don't know if you can see it, but basically, he talks about, um, so it's an inverted pyramid. I'm going to read to you what it says, uh, top to bottom. Text, sentence, clause, phrase, word, morphine, phoneme. And in summary, phonology, morphology, syntax, discourse, grammar, vocabulary, phonology, phonology, discourse. So we have to know more about this. We have to study this, and we have to be able to use the language well, it is true that, um, of course, English is the only language ever to be more spoken as a second language, second, third, fourth, than as a first language. Um, and I am not even saying, and I am really not saying, that natives should be the model. What I am saying is that proficiency should be the goal for, for, for English teachers. Yeah? I mean, uh, somebody mentioned here, I'm sorry, uh, it's hard to keep up with what's going on in the chat, but somebody mentioned the CPE. I do think everybody, every teacher of English should be, should have as, as a goal to have the CPE at some point of their career, not necessarily the certificate, but that level, the, 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 the C2 level. And I actually think that getting to the CPE, getting to the C2 level is not the end of it. Yeah? Um, I, for example, did do the CPE in 2005. It's been 10 years, and I think I have actually studied and improved a lot since then, and I am still not happy with it. So I still think that there is a lot to do after the CPE, but um, perhaps having the CPE as a goal, if, if, if you don't have it yet, is, is what I'm talking about. Now, you know what? I could be wrong. I could be wrong. The TKT, for example, demands from, not demands, but they suggest that uh, the people who sit the, the, the TKT modules have a B1 level. Yeah, so it's a B1 level. I think we should all be um, working towards a C2 level. Now, again, I could be wrong, but how about we talk about that more then and, and, and decide what it is that, of course, there are different contexts too. It depends on, on, on where you teach and, and uh, your, what, what your stu students' goals are. But perhaps could we come up with uh, 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 a bare minimum, or or uh, perhaps discuss different uh, possibilities. Yeah, exactly, Merrick. So again, I completely agree with you. But have a look at Merrick's uh, question. What if we demanded CPE in language awareness from uh, native speakers? If such a test test existed, I, I agree with you. Most of them wouldn't pass. You know, so it should be. Uh, I don't know if most of them, right? I mean, that that just came out. But, uh, many of them, or, or, or some of them, would not pass, for sure. Uh, so I agree with you. That should be the goal for, for native speakers as well. But again, as, as we discussed in the beginning, before the recording started, 
I think we're talking about two different things here. Yeah, we are talking about people who already have a command over the language, native uh, speakers, educated native speakers. That is, and also, um, and then on what I am talking about is teachers who cannot communicate or who have a lot of difficulty to communicate, and students notice that. Of course, they do, uh, and um, this hurts us all. So, so, so it is high time we talked more openly about this, but without mincing words so much, yeah? without sugarcoating the thing so much. Yeah? I personally think that a B1 level should not be the goal for a, a, a teacher of English, which is uh, perhaps not what, what, what Cambridge suggests in the TKT, but it's the minimum level that they require or that they suggest for people sitting in the TKT. I personally think B1 is not the level that's going to, to, to enable us all to fight this prejudice. I don't think it is the B1 level. I really don't think it is the B1 level. It might not be C2, but perhaps we could come up with, uh, I don't know, a point in the, in the middle. Uh, and of course, we also have to know methodology and technique and so on, but this is, we talk about that all the time, right? That's what teacher training courses is, both pre-service and in-service, uh, dedicate to. This is what, as I mentioned before, all the periodicals talk about and all the conferences talk about. This is covered. This is absolutely covered. I mean, we don't need to get people to talk more about this because they, all they can do is talk about this, you know? For example, technology. I think technology in education is extremely important, extremely important. But I would say that language development for teachers is even more important. And which of the two do we talk more about? Uh, ECP Merrick is the Michigan version of the CPE. And, uh, so CP is Cambridge, ECP is um, Michigan. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on. So a very simple question. I, I, so I study a lot of English, right? I actually think this is the most important thing. That's what I'm here talking about. So I study a lot of English and I listen to a lot of podcasts. So for example, I listen to the BBC World News every day or almost every day. And last year I came across this uh, on BBC World News or Global News. I don't know. Police stations have been being seized. And then I posted on Facebook to my friends. Most of my friends on Facebook are teachers, of course. And I asked them, how does that sound to you? There's actually a link here. Yeah, I can send you, at the end of the, of the webinar, I'm going to give you my email address. And uh, if you want, I can actually send you this link to you so that you can listen to it. Yeah? I'm not making, making an example up just to prove my point. The guy actually said this. And I don't know uh, what you think about this, but I would... I, if a student of mine had written this in, 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 a, in, a, in a composition, in, in, in a piece of writing, I would have corrected it. I would have said, no, police stations have been seized, not have been being seized. Um, so I was shocked because this is not live. I mean, this was edited. It's a podcast. And yet it was accepted and, and, and it was there in the podcast. So I asked my friends. And then I'm going to show you the highlights uh, of the answers I got. Awful. Wasn't he stuttering? Native speakers don't speak. It is so embarrassing when supposedly educated people, blah, blah, blah. Then look at this one. This is really, really good. Uh, if we can say stations are being seized, why not stations have been being seized? How else would you say exactly the same thing if it started in the past and it's still going on as we speak, blah, blah, blah. And then, ah, there's more, sorry. <laughs> this is a funny one. Why do people suppose that us native speakers get it right all the time? He made a mistake. His focus was probably on describing what was happening. It was a news item, not an English lesson. Then, hi, Sue, thank you. So you think it's okay, all right. But would you say that? Because the thing is, now I know it's okay, because I actually uh, uh, did a bit of research, but uh, I would never say, for example, I've been being married for eight years. Yeah? And um, so, so, so we don't normally use been being. Really. It is certainly not the most common way of, of, of getting that point across. And you see, we have here in this slide the vast majority of the, 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 the comments that I chose to share here, they were made by native speakers. 
So most native speakers thought this was um, weird, yeah? weird to say the least. And then Natalia Guerrero, by the way, this is the second link that I'm going to share with you. This is a post on Richmond Share by my friend Natalia Guerrero, a uh, Brazilian teacher, uh, talking about um, language development for teachers. So she suggested this link here. You're also going to have access to, to this link. And uh, it was basically a text explaining how that is possible, but it's rare and it's not so commonly used anymore. And then I was also, uh, I also found this one in the Cambridge Grammar of English. You can read here at the bottom that repeated or extended events which are felt to be developing, ongoing, or perhaps temporary may occasionally lead to the use of progressive for such verbs, uh, mental processing sense verbs. The water has definitely been tasting better since we bought the fuel and so on. I don't know if it's exactly the same case, but okay, granted, it's a possibility. But you see, lots of teachers disagreed. Most of the teachers who commented on my original post thought it was bad English. Yeah. And I think that that illustrates the point, the point even that Merrick was making, that we all need to study more English than we do. All of us, regardless of where we're from, regardless of what our first language is. But I think it is high time, again, we talked about the fact that we nests need to study it even more because we are much as people never talk about that we are at a linguistic disadvantage of course we are i mean it is not our first language sometimes uh, uh well we have i have lots of problems with prepositions yeah uh, i say things sometimes that i mean when, when, I, when i have the chance to listen to that i'm never going to watch this webinar for example because i don't want to see the mistakes i've made i am never ever going to watch this again uh so we make mistakes. Of course, we are at a linguistic disadvantage. I think there are many advantages to being an S, many. Uh, but language is not one of them, and not our language, not our use of the language. And we have to talk about this. It cannot be a secret. It cannot be something that we only talk about um, in closed Facebook groups. Yeah? And we have to talk more about this in, 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 in teachers' courses. We have to talk about this in articles. We have to write books about this. So, for example, uh, now, well, there are mostly there are Brazilians here in the room, but these are some things, for example, that um, I see teachers have problems with all the time. And then again, maybe nests too, but, uh, sorry, maybe natives too, but definitely nests. For example, we learn and we teach conditionals in terms of zero, first, second, third, and sometimes mixed, but there is so much more out there about conditionals. Yeah? So Stephanie says, I have problems with two and four. Me too, and all the ones in between. Then, uh, so is it possible to say, if you will, blah, 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 I will? It is. It is possible. But this doesn't get taught very often in Brazil. Um, is, is using could or be able to for ability in the past interchangeable? No. But we say to students all the time that they are. What's the difference between who and whom? Uh, and, and it's not only a grammatical difference, it's a difference of views, it's a difference of register. Yeah. Do we always put the verb one stage back when using reported speech? No. I recommend she be promoted. Is that correct? Yes. Um, what are, what's an inversion? What's a non-finite clause? Now, uh, again, referring to, uh, I'm not going to quote uh, verbatim, but referring to, to, to Scott's article again, uh, it is not the, 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 um, the meta language, it is not knowing terminology that's going to make you a better teacher. This is not what I'm talking about when I talk about grammar. I'm talking about understanding how language is used in a way that is not just communicative. Oh, I can't believe I haven't said this yet. The thing of being communicative. Yesterday, um, and I posted about this webinar, a friend from Canada, Chris, Chris Watts, asked me, but what's more important, fluency or accuracy? So communication or perfection. Uh, I think that when we're talking about teachers, both teachers should not only aim at being communicative. Being communicative is not enough for teachers. I mean, teachers should be accurate as well, or as accurate as possible. I'm not talking about speaking American English or British English or Australian English. I'm talking about speaking good 
correct, accurate, fluent English that you can use to communicate with people all over the world. So we need to know more about the language, but well, then it's personal opinion. I do think we need to know the meta language as well, yeah, which is a different thing. But I do think professionals of the language have to know uh, the terminology as well, regardless of whether you use it in class or not. But we have to be uh, aware of it. I mean, we're, we're professionals. Phonology. I, I love this quote. It's Scrivener. I don't even know if he if this quote is in the newest edition of his book, but I love it anyway. It says pronunciation can be an overlooked area of language teaching, partly because teachers themselves may feel more uncertain about it. Yeah. So again, um, and I was surprised to see that uh, uh, Thornberry's article focuses primarily and talks mostly about grammar because I don't think it is just grammar. I think phonology is extremely important, and perhaps it's the area teachers know the least about. Again, Merrick said in the beginning, uh, when we were just chatting, he said that uh, he saw at the end of his Delta many you know, native speakers who could not transcribe words at the end of the course. So, of course, that this is a problem for all of us, but uh, the, the, the transcribing aspect, I mean. But the thing is, um, we, nests, are the ones who have problems using connected English. Or, or, or sounding appropriate in terms of intonation sometimes. So we, we don't only have to learn, as is the case of the, the, the native speakers in this particular regard, we don't only have to learn the terminology to teach it, or the tools, the means to teach it better. We actually have to improve our pronunciation, our connected speech, our intonation, all the features. Uh, I like to use this song. I'm not going to go into uh, that now because I only have 10 minutes left. But I very much like to use this song uh, in teachers' courses. It could be any song, obviously. But to draw teachers' attention to, to, to elements of connected speech that are very, 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 very rarely taught because teachers either don't really have them in their own speech uh, uh, or because they notice it, but for some reason they don't think it's important to teach it as well. For example, the fact that get can be pronounced get with the elision of the sound t. Or uh, again, in Jason Rass's uh, uh, pronunciation, he's American, he says, because here it comes, because here it comes, not because here. And this is very common, for example, when you say teller, telling, giver, and so on. Beautiful light. She told me, do it with the uh, intrusive wa and everything. And I think that even if teachers do not pronounce words like that, because it, there's nothing wrong, of course, with saying people get ready, get ready, um, teaching phonology and drawing students' attention to these aspects of phonology actually improve their listening. So uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's not only so that you can talk like that. Nobody has to talk like Jason Raz, but you have to be able to understand Jason Raz and, 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 and other American speakers of English and British speakers of English. And understanding these features of phonology is key, is really very important, and most teachers don't. Right? The vast majority of teachers don't. And then I agree with Mary that native speakers include. I mean, they, they, they know this, they might use this, but they rarely, if ever, teach this. So uh, perhaps this is an element of, of language development that is common for both nests and natives. There are many more. I'm not going to go into them. Sorry, sake of time. Uh, so, what are, what, what are these sounds? I mean, do teachers use phonemic symbols in class? It's okay not to use phonemic symbols in class if you don't, because you don't see the point. But you could, if you wanted to, because you know how. Yeah? Uh, so, how do you pronounce the regular verbs in the past? And, and it's a curious thing. This is a very common problem in Brazil. I'm sure everybody is going to, to, to recognize this. Same things like work it and... Uh, uh, wash it, and so on. Yeah? And we teach simple past absolutely every day of our lives, every day of our careers. And I think getting the regular verbs wrong for a teacher is pretty serious. It's something that we should be addressing and we should be working on, 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 on not getting them wrong anymore. How do you pronounce the final S in plural words? Uh, and I'm not even talking necessarily about the differences between S and S, because they change in connected speech so wildly that uh, perhaps it's not so important, but perhaps, but certainly pronouncing teaches instead of 
teach, as it's very common for teachers uh, in Brazil. This is very important, and that might actually be communication. Yeah. So these are serious language issues that need to be addressed, that need to be understood. How do you count syllables in English? Are there rules for word stress? I mean, curiously, there are, actually. But sentence stress, what sense stress? I think this is possibly the hardest thing for Brazilian speakers of English and uh, for Brazilian teachers of English as well, getting the stress, uh, the sentence stress right, you know, sounding uh, fluent. And, and students notice that, and that hurts us, that hurts career prospects. Really. So we need to work on this, and we need to talk about this. Um, and then moving on, um, vocabulary. What's a collocation? What's a need? I'm sorry, guys, I am going to um, run a little bit now because I'm rapidly running out of time and I don't want to keep you any longer on a Sunday. So rise or raise your hand. Can you imagine a hand rising I and mean, how weird that would be? But this is commonly used, actually, in Brazil. It's commonly, it's a mistake that's commonly made. Uh, and, and also a uh, semantic precision and lexical variation and stuff like that. Also things that are very important and we work very little on them, you know, on improving our, our use of vocabulary. Well, how to go about studying language then? Again, these are things that have worked for me and that I suggest for my teacher students, for teachers preparing for the CAE, for the CPE and, and so on. Be curious about the language. I mean, for example, when you come across something like uh, police stations have been being seized, and you think that sounds odd, or you don't know what, what, what that means. I was just reading, I'm reading a very nice book at the moment, The Girl on the Train, highly recommend it. And uh, I found it here. I feel them at one remove, at one remove. That's an expression I had never seen before. So if you've never seen it before, if you're not sure of what it means, look it up, learn to use it. Yeah? Learn what it means, learn to use it. Uh, <clears throat> vast and varied reading, you'll see I repeated reading several times here, you can see it again. And I didn't repeat it because I ran out of ideas because I actually think teachers should read and that the best language exercise there is, is reading vastly, variedly. You, know, you have to read a lot. I think it's part of being a teacher, and it helps you tremendously improve your English. Exposure to native language, to proficient English, watching videos on TED, for example, which I actually suggest in the next slide. Organization and focus, it's not just when you have time. And I'm not talking about reading, for example, grammatical explanations at the back of the course books you use, because that is full of half-truths and outright lies and simplifications that should not be enough for teachers. Okay. Then moving on, <clears throat> have a vocabulary notebook for every time you come across interesting vocabulary, write it down, write it down with an example sentence so that you can actually uh, remember uh, and revisit as well, because right? you have to encounter this vocabulary several times to actually turn passive vocabulary into active vocabulary, but also just improving your passive vocabulary is very important. And again, read books, articles, news, blogs, recipes, graffiti, everything. Watch series, movies, TV programs, get hooked on TED. TED is, I will never ever accept that TED was not made by teachers for teachers of English because it is just so perfect for teachers, not, not only for teachers to use in class, but also to use to improve their English, yeah, uh, very importantly. You have talks about absolutely every uh, uh, area of, of human interest and, and human knowledge. So you, you, you learn a lot of specific, interesting vocabulary in, 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 and you're exposed to, to authentic use of English, to, to connected speech and so on. Set a time to study. I mean, don't just study when you have time because you're never going to have time and you're never going to have more time. You're not going to be less busy next year. You're not going to be less busy the year before. Yeah. If anything, you're going to get more and more busy. So you have to incorporate this into your schedules, really, because you're not magically going to have more time next year. It's not going to happen. I mean, how long have you been trying to have more time? Use Google, yeah? Google stuff, read. Read. Read every day. Read all the time. Read whenever you have a minute. For example, in Brazil here, so 
Last year, uh, right before the World Cup, we had a lot of protests uh, in Brazil. People took to the streets and they, they, they marched against a number of things in, in, in various places all over the country. So students wanted to talk about this, right? Of course they did. And, um, and then they would ask uh, uh, teachers how to say riot police, how do you say tear gas, how do you say, which in Portuguese is gas lacrimogenio, and, 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 and they don't know. But if instead of reading about it in the Brazilian media, you read about it in the international media, you would know at least a little bit. Read about the World Cup, read about the elections, read about uh, the, the corruption scandals that are going on, that are happening in Brazil at the moment. Read about them, about these, also in the international press. Yeah? Learn how they refer to, to, to the things happening in Brazil in the international press, because then you'll be able to help your students better with that. Of course, foster autonomy, uh, si uh, um, suggest this to students as well, that they go and read about international news in international uh, newspapers, but do that yourself. I mean, uh, it's funny how, uh, Merrick, is it absolutely horrific if I am five minutes late? Or is it okay if I finish hands? Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, it's okay, very interesting. Right. So, uh, please, please do, do go on. Um, I Thank hope you. James right. doesn't mind either. Uh, James, just five more minutes, I promise. Uh, what was I saying? Mm, right. It, it, is, it is very common in teacher training. It's very common. We do this all the time to tell teachers, look, it's impossible to know everything. You're never going to know everything. Uh, it, and... All right, I mean, that's obvious. Of course, we're never going to know everything. Of course, we're never going to know everything. Of course, uh, uh, students are sometimes going to ask us things that we don't know how to answer, and that we're going to have to, to, we're going to have to promise to answer the next class. We're going to have to go now, get your phone, go to Google, and find out on the spot. Of course, everybody knows that. Perhaps it's time we started talking about or, or, or we changed our, our, our speech a little bit and said, look, while it's true that you don't have to know everything, you do have to know a lot more. Yeah? It's not everything. Of course, granted, nobody is ever going to know everything about anything. But you do have to know more. You need to be better informed. You need to learn more. You need to study more and read more. So I think perhaps we could do that. And again, in, in, in the article I've referred to several times, uh, Scott Thornburg's article. He also says that developing hedging techniques, and of course, he is talking about native speakers most of the time. But he says, um, but you'll never be able to answer all of the questions that get thrown at you. So it's worth developing some hedging strategies, such as throwing the question back on the learners, promising an answer in the next lesson. I absolutely agree with that, of course. But isn't it also good for your morale, if nothing else? to be able to answer most of students' questions, to actually have more answers at the tip of your tongue than we do at the moment. Yeah? So I think we should start thinking a little bit about that too. Now, to finish, I have asked many of the famous ELT writers by email, Facebook, I mean, I've pestered them in many different ways. And these are some of the answers that I got. Obviously, I'm not gonna say who said what, but, just for you to have an idea how it seems to me everybody agrees, and yet no one will talk about it. The feeling is perhaps that no native speaker teachers should need no special treatment, and to offer it might be seen as insulting. I hope it doesn't sound insulting. I do think we need special treatment. I don't think a teacher's linguistic needs are the same needs uh, as a student's needs. I don't think we need the same things. I don't think we have the same goals students do. So I disagree with this uh, vehemently, if that's how you pronounce this word. Uh, we do need special treatment. We are a special group of people. We are not just regular students, regular advanced students. We're teachers. And what's demanded or what should be demanded from us is definitely different from what should be demanded or, and, and what is demanded usually from students. I think the sad reality is, though, that for a very large number of the world's teachers, their English is barely above A2, B1, to be generous. It would be extremely helpful if this course book writer, next time he or she is in Turkey or Brazil or, or Argentina or, or uh, wherever, that he or she said that to the audience. 
Yeah. It's an important topic, but a very sensitive one. In fact, teachers self-esteem badly. I agree, but unfortunately, if we're going to use this as an, ex as an excuse to never talk about it, we're never going to improve. I think no native speaker language teachers ideally should have a certain, I, I love this, a certain level on IELTS or TOEFL or Cambridge exams. What is a certain level on IELTS? Like three or on TOEFL? 50 Cambridge exams. Which one? Pat? Yeah, so perhaps, again, I have said a million times and now I'm going to say for the last time, perhaps it's time uh, uh, we were a little bit more specific about this, isn't it? Uh, because a certain level uh, is very, very hard to, to, to understand. Yeah. All right, so my opinion then, to wrap up, this is, by the way, the cover of the magazine that I edit. I'm the editor of the Brastiso newsletter, and this was my very first issue as editor. Look what it, what it says on the cover, obviously. We need to talk about our English. Yeah. Uh, so my opinion is that this is too important an issue to overlook. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to ourselves, really. We owe it to our students. Okay? Let's see. As uh, James said, I feel very uncomfortable saying that. I can easily come across as very... You know what, James? I don't know. It, it could sound... And, and look, believe me, I have gotten, after these talks, I've gotten some very angry emails. And I have been called a number of things because of this. But unfortunately, um, I think that it's a risk we have to take, you know, because no one's talking about this. And I actually think, uh, I'm disagreeing with you a little bit, that it would be fantastic if it also came from you okay? and from uh, native speakers of English all over the world. Okay? It's at the very least as important as everything else, as knowing how to use technology, as knowing how to teach writing, as knowing how, how to teach listening. It is at the very least as important as everything else. So this, guys, to finish, is a book that I have written. I'm very proud of it. It's coming out now in October. And uh, for those of you who are not Brazilian, I'm sure you can see the titles in Portuguese. English professor, which means I mean, roughly and uh, translating a teacher's English. And uh, it is, of course, aimed at Brazilian teachers of English. And uh, when I pitched the idea to the publisher, I said that it had to be in English. And the publisher really liked the idea, agreed to publish and everything. But then the only thing, out of everything that I had suggested, the only thing that was uh, dismissed out of hand was it being written in English. He said to me, do you want to sell this book? I mean, do you actually want people to buy it? Because if you actually want people to buy it, it has to be in Portuguese because there is a great number of teachers of English in Brazil who will never buy a book in English simply because they can't understand it or because they think they wouldn't be able to understand it. Yeah, maybe they would, but they're not even going to try. They're not even willing to try. The reason this book was written in Portuguese is one of the reasons why we need to talk more or at all about this. Yeah? We need help. We nests need to study more English. We need to discuss this more. And we need, perhaps, more people to tell us that. So help me, please. Ask this as a nest. Ask this as a teacher, ask this as someone who uh, really wants to see their, uh, his fellow Brazilian teachers succeed. I want to see Brazilians give plenaries at IATAFL. I want to see Brazilians give plenaries at uh, TESOL and everywhere else. And Argentinians and Uruguayans and Turkish people. And in order for us to do that, we need help. We need to understand that we need to study more English. So help me write the next one in English. Thank you very much. And uh, this is my, thank you. This is the elephant leaving the room, as you can see. <laughs> uh, bibliography, uh, bibliography, e references. And you can get all that if you write me an email, I'll send you the bibliography and we can get in touch. Add me on Facebook, let's keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Right, thanks, Igor. It was uh, it was really really interesting. So uh, um, maybe we can uh, hang around for another couple of minutes to see if, um, if people have any Absolutely. any questions. And uh, yeah, just a personal comment about that book. I find it. Um, find it absolutely shocking that as an English teacher uh, you wouldn't be able to read a book in English. I just, so I do mean, I. I can't even, so I can't, it just goes beyond my head. I can't really comprehend it. I can't, uh, I mean, like if I, for example, I can, you know, I can speak, you know, a little bit of Portuguese, but I'd never imagined teaching Portuguese because it's just not good enough. Like, I mean, I would, I would really have to work for another couple of years on it to ever, uh, bear walk in in the classroom, but it and it's a similar mm -hmm. thing um, happened when uh, I spoke at TESO France, and uh, one of the um, the organizers told me that uh, the reason why there are almost no French English teachers at the conference is that they wouldn't be able to understand what the presenters are talking about, and I just I mean <laughs> again I just couldn't believe it. It was just but it's it's the reality unfortunately. It is, and uh, I really think that um, this is one of the main issues. I mean, at the, the at the very center of this prejudice that we that we suffer as nests in in ELT is that sometimes we do have language issues, and by not talking about it, we're not helping anyone. On the contrary, we're just uh, perpetuating this 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 really 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 serious problem. Yeah. I, I, I am very shocked too that I had to write this book in Portuguese. But you know what, Mary? I actually uh, agree with what the publisher said. Uh, and it's not any publisher, it's possibly the biggest publisher in the area in Brazil. And so they really know what they're talking about. And the thing is, if I think of the audience, of the, the people I wrote this book for, um, it is actually true. It's horrible, but it's actually true that many of them will not buy the book in English, even if it is about language development. So um, it is it is shocking. I mean, uh, because as you say, you said that, you know, uh, they won't even try to understand it, right? Which is which is even worse. Um, I yes. Um, because I mean, when you're when you I'm, I'm big into learning languages in general, I, you know, I really like learning different languages. And the first thing that you do is what, what you were saying here, like, I mean, if you want to learn, let's say, Portuguese, um, well, then start reading things in Portuguese um, that you enjoy. For example, I really like football, so I, you know, I would read about the World Cup in, you know, on I don't know, or Globo or something like this. Um, you know, a Portuguese Absolutely. newspaper, just to get the the input. Even if you're not getting everything, you you know, uh, you're getting into the language, the, the the culture, and you know, and that's you know that's the basics, isn't it? It's not something we change overnight, but we, but we have to, 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 to start. And I, I actually think reading is the best way, the best way to go about it. I owe 90% of my English, my vocabulary, everything really, except for perhaps pronunciation, to reading. And, and that's what I try to, to, to impart to, to teachers, to student teachers, because, or teacher students, because uh, I actually think this makes an enormous difference. I think there's a... So, Emma, um, question there from Hamil. Um, Emily. Um, how did you start it? I presume it's. Um, uh, well, actually, uh, Mary could answer that too as a, as a nest himself. But, uh, well, I've been studying English since I was nine, and I'm now 35. So, but I've never studied it abroad. Uh, I studied in a local school from their basic level until their advanced level. I finished when I was 18. And. Um, and I think then, then I actually started studying, yeah? Start reading a lot, and I love movies, I love music, although I can't play anything, and that's really frustrating. But um, I listen to a lot of music, I watch a lot of shows, and uh, I read a lot, I think. Uh, uh, this is basically what I owe, whatever English I know, to. How about you, Eric? Well, I, I started, I think, when I was, when I was seven in, in, in school, in, in a public school in Poland, and then I also had um, private classes and I went to a language school, um, but I think I was, if I look back at it and if I, if I were to do it again, I would have done it very differently. Um, I think I was very ineffective because it, you know, it took me, I don't know, something, something strange like 10 years to get to proficiency or, or something like that. 
Um, so I think you can do it in, in a much more effective way, like for example, when I was more recently when I was learning French or, or Portuguese, I did it more through you know reading things or listening to things that interest me, learning a lot of chunks um, on memorize. Mm -hmm. I really like um, memorize so I'd, I'd learn you know a lot of chunks um, there and then try to use it as, as whenever you get a chance to, to use the language that you want to learn, just just go for it and uh, it can be very embarrassing. Now I'm, I'm in Switzerland and uh, um, I don't understand people in shops sometimes when they speak French, but you know, you have to persist and uh, you know, when they speak to you in English, you have to try and uh, um, you know, talk to them in French and try and you know, improve it that way, I think. Absolutely, yeah, that's it, I couldn't agree more. Reading, reading and listening to a lot of authentic language. I think, I think for me, um, it would be, I think it, reading is very important, but um, like I, I think I would emphasize um, listening personally because I think it's there's there's a, um, a closer connection with uh, speaking. Um, I personally think because, for example, if you if you read if I read something in French, I can probably understand you know sort of 99% of what I'm reading, but when I listen. And when I want to say things, it's much more difficult, I think, because it's, it's faster, the connected speech and, mm -hmm, and everything. You, you don't have time to process it. But, but I do agree with you that you know, reading is a fantastic way um, to, to improve your vocabulary and your language in general. Yeah. Well, what Stephanie says here is really interesting. I agree with you, Stephanie. You know what? Sometimes you are actually going to be judged, really. It's true. But that can stop you because if it if it stops you, then you're never going to to, to put yourself out there and and, and improve. And, and I think the more successful communication opportunities you have, the more confident you're going to feel to have more. So um, it's not easy, but you have to try whenever you have a proficient speaker around to to actually try and and, and talk to him or her to them because. Um, that's a fantastic learning opportunity. I, mean, to, when, I, I forgot to say that during the webinar, but I firmly believe that that one of the uh, fallacies that, is, that we say in teacher training courses is that you're going to improve your English teaching. I don't think teaching English improves your English. I think studying while you prepare classes improves your English very much. But what I mean by this is when you're speaking English with your students, especially at A2, B1, B2 level, that doesn't improve your English at all. You have to... No, it to actually, I'd, I'd say it... Uh... It weakens English, like I mean, possibly. You possibly. have to, you have to dumb it down so much that. Uh, but uh, coming back to Stephanie's and and Jason, I mean, I think. It's it's definitely true, and I I felt embarrassed so many times in different languages. But it's it's necessary, and un unless you you get over it and just just get on with it, and uh, you know. Um, Try and speak. You will. You will never improve. I think it's. You know. It's very easy to uh, to be in your comfort zone and uh, and avoid interacting with proficient speakers. But uh, mm -hmm. but it's not really going to get you anywhere. Absolutely. That's it. That's it. So James, uh, when we meet on October second, we're only going to speak Portuguese then, so you can practice. All right then, guys. Really, again. Merrick, I want to thank you very much for the for the opportunity. Thank you, James. Thanks, Belta. Thanks, uh, Tafel Equity. Thanks, everyone uh, who, who was here today. Let's keep in touch. I mean, write emails and and uh, add me on Facebook. Let's keep in touch. Yeah, thank you. No, it was uh, it was a fascinating uh, webinar, and uh, we said it will be on uh, on YouTube. Uh, so you can uh, you can send a link uh, later on to uh, to your friends and anyone. Uh, might be interested in uh, in watching it. So yeah, thanks thanks a lot. It was uh, was Good fantastic. Uh, muito obrigado. De nada. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. See you, people. All right. Have a good Sunday. Have a good.